There are many things that decline with age, mm. and it's it's trying to figure out, you know, would correcting that decline actually result in improved health? Mm. It, it may do. I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying that this molecule isn't exciting. I think it is exciting, um, but, but I think that that excitement needs to be generated. Uh, sorry, it needs to be directed to well-conducted human trials because, uh, you know, otherwise the supplements that, that people would be taking, you know, the, the list would just be massive. Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast, I'm your host Seam Lund and today our guest is Dr. Brad Stanfield. Brad is a medical doctor from New Zealand. He also makes YouTube videos about extending health span and longevity. This episode is brought to you by Blue Blocks, my favorite light and sleep optimization companies. Artificial light at night exposure is associated with diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer and Alzheimer's. Blue Blocks provides the highest quality blue blocking glasses that filter out the specific wavelengths that have been shown to suppress melatonin in studies. Melatonin is more than the sleep hormone. It's also vital for longevity, anti-aging and immunity. Artificial light exposure suppresses melatonin up to 99% and makes your brain think that it's daytime before bed. That's why I love using Blue Blocks to guarantee my body is making high amounts of melatonin prior to sleep. They also have daytime lenses that you can use to reduce digital eye strain and retinal damage when working in front of a computer all day. You can get a sweet 15% discount of all the Blue Blocks glasses, red light light bulbs, red light devices and sleep masks if you head over to blueblocks.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com forward slash seamlund and the code is seam15, S-I-I-M-15. Dr. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we have a nice uh, meeting going on like we are in New Zealand. It's uh, 5 a.m. and I'm like in Estonia, which is uh, 5 p.m. So <laughs> nice little uh, time zone differences. Uh, yeah. And you have like a really uh, awesome YouTube channel about uh, just optimizing health span and uh, longevity. But you're also like a medical doctor. So I'll, like I'm curious, like are you still taking patients? So, and, uh, you know, what, what made you uh, start the YouTube channel in the first place? Yeah, so I still see patients. So... This is why we're getting up so early. Well, why I'm getting up so early now. So yeah, I work full-time at the clinic. So um, I'm seeing patients and that's my full-time job. And then I do YouTube in the mornings and on the weekends. Um, and I wanted to start this channel because I think there's so many different men who can maximize their, um, their health within their life. Then towards the end of their life, they can still do the activities that they want to do and still be productive because, you know, I... I I'm dealing with a lot of patients who are reaching their older years and, you know, that they're having to use walking sticks, walking frames. And you can see such a massive difference between people who have been able to look after themselves. Um, you know, so, so you've got some fantastic 90 year olds who can still get out and do the things that they want to do. But on the flip side, I've got some 65 year olds who are extremely crumbly with their health. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just sad that, you know, if, if you start, early enough, you can make a massive difference towards the end of your life. So I wanted to start this channel to discuss some of the research around that, because mm -hmm. I also realized that there's quite a lot of snake oil out there as well. So I okay. wanted to provide people a resource that they could go to, <clears throat> where I simply just focus in on what the research says, um, and keep that updated. Mm, nice, nice. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really uh, good. And you're right in the sense that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you haven't taken care of yourself, all throughout your life or even in your late, later years only then there's going to be like a huge difference between you and the person who doesn't take care of their health that much and it uh, becomes more pronounced the older you get so like a person a person who is 80 years old and they exercise regularly then they look and probably feel like they're 60 years old or something compared to someone who doesn't exercise at all and they feel like 90 years old <laughs> so like there's a the older you get then the kind of bigger the gap bet between people who exercise and people who don't exercise becomes uh, whereas when you're like in your 20s then there's not much not, not much difference um visible or um like your biological difference uh, in terms of your whether you're 20 years old or 30 years old but you know the gap kind of gets so uh, huge when you're uh, after like i would say like after your 50s or something and it becomes like super important yeah, that's right. There has been some interesting data coming out this year showing the rate of metabolism for humans as we age. And it seems to drop off a cliff around the age of 60 years old. So it, that's really where you start to see the differences um, mm. in someone who has been looking after themselves and, as you say, has been exercising compared to those who don't. Mm. So, yeah, I just yeah. get passionate about that because there mm -hmm. is so much that we can do. Yeah, curious you mentioned that study. Uh, I also saw that. And but one of the interesting finding from that was that uh, 
like the metabolism did drop, but only in the like yeah, 60s and late, later years. It kind of stayed very stable all throughout the 40s and 50s. Uh, uh, so it didn't change that much. So people who are saying, you know, that already in their 30s or 40s saying that old age is catching up on them like and they can't lose weight that easily uh which that isn't like really true because the metabolism the basal metabolic rate would stay the same uh up until the 60s etc uh so it's yeah you know mostly still uh, lifestyle habits and uh, these uh overall routines that you do that matter more and there's not there isn't anything inherently holding you back uh, until you are literally uh, in your 60s or 70s and in your 50s and 40s you, there's still a lot of um, your bio your biology is still very uh, capable if you have been taking care of it uh, the proper way yeah that's right and particularly if you're maximizing the baseline so so mm. when you're reaching that point where your metabolism does start to drop off if your baseline is higher because you've been looking after yourself compared to someone else then that you know that, that drop is is less com compared to someone else so Again, there's so much that you can do. Um, so I'm excited to talk with you about all those different strategies. Yeah, yeah. But before let's maybe let's talk about you know, like some of your patients. Um, what are some of maybe like the biggest things um, that they struggle with, uh, or the most often things uh, they more, most commonly struggle with uh, in terms of health span and longevity? Like what are the I don't know, like biomarkers or uh, overall uh, indicators of just uh, aging and uh, health? So I focus in on people who are who are truly ill so for example true type 2 diabetics um so I, I get quite passionate about their health because there is such a difference that we can make around diet exercise and also specific medications that we can use so if if i was assessing someone's health generally who, who was otherwise well some of the things that i'd be looking at is particularly things like you know their cholesterol profile their hba1c looking at their sugar levels their blood pressure um, their height, their weight, general things like that. Um, I think if you, you, you can definitely get into the weeds of, you know, things like DNA methylation clocks and high sensitivity CRPs to look at your overall levels of inflammation. They're interesting, but I think that the things that, that actually seem to matter at this point is, yeah, height, weight, blood pressure, diet and exercise. Those are the things that you can really make a difference in mm. um, for, for yeah. the otherwise healthy people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like uh, those DNA methylation clocks and the biological age clocks. Uh, yeah, they're super interesting, but they can be, uh, I think they're not like uh, fully uh, accurate or they can be uh, very uh, sensitive to changes. And yeah, even if in your like just the 20s, they're like bound to change as well. And uh, they don't, they may not, they can give like some interesting uh, things to know, uh, but they, they're not like, you know, definite because, you know, for me, well, my, some people get like some crazy results that, um, the their biological age is like 25 or 30 and the or the you know, the chronological age is 30 and their biological age is like 65 or something which doesn't like really make sense um whereas for me like it was like my when i did the test uh dna clock then um my uh, chronological age was uh 26 and my biological age was uh 16 <laughs> so uh you know th there's the i think it's 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 definitely like super it's something interesting and people want to know that what's the what's their age like uh in the like biological level uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm much rather yeah focus again yeah, on the just the biomarkers, the kind of basic biomarkers. Yeah, I mean with, with the DNA methylation clocks, they they are interesting. My issue with them is that there's many different ways of measuring DNA methylation age, if you like, and we don't have a validated method yet. So, for example, if someone doesn't exercise and you measure their DNA methylation age, and then they do start exercising, you're going to see changes in DNA expression. And mm. how do you then correlate that to say, well, instead of being 60, you're now 55, you know, the, again, right. the, there's so many different ways of measuring that. And will that then correlate to, um, you know, f resistance against disease or, or a stronger metabolism? We don't have that data yet. So it's interesting. Mm. Um, but personally, you know, I, I'm not going to use my money buying a DNA methylation clock because again, it, it, in my opinion, it's not telling me anything that I don't already know that, mm. you know, diet, exercise, sleep, meditation, those mm. are the things that truly matter. And I'm not going to change any of that, depending on what a DNA methylation clock tells me. Mm. Yeah, I, I do think that there was uh, one study that found like every, uh, every like four years of uh, increased DNA methyl methylation age was associated with like slightly higher mortality. Um, but I think it's it's very like preliminary and it's not um, yeah 
not that uh, important or compared to like yeah the biomarkers that determine whether or not you get uh, heart disease or um, metabolic syndrome and those things yeah um but yeah well, like what are the, some of the kind of the basics then uh, to let's say you have someone who, who is ill who comes to who comes to you for help uh, they have you know uh, bad biomarkers they're overweight they're um you know, not fit, and uh, they are essentially like you know, <laughs> not expected to live a long and healthy life. And so, what what's kind of the starter starter pack <laughs> to start putting them on the right track? Yeah. So the starter pack is making sure that you do have a baseline of their health. So again, it's height, weight, blood pressure. Then it's their general. Um, if they're overweight, I'd I'd possibly look at their liver function because I'd want to do a, a brief assessment to see if they've got fatty liver. Um, again, it will be HbA1c to look at their blood sugar levels and their cholesterol. That's that's the general scope um, of, of blood panels that, that I would do. And then it's trying to find out, you know, why is that person unhealthy? So for example, if they're having a particularly bad diet that's high in sugar, um, is it, are they comfort eating? You know, are they dealing with depression? Have in, in, within their life, if they recently lost their job or have has a family member recently taken ill, you know, th th there's a lot of, it, it's easy to, to look at a patient to say, you are overweight, you need to lose weight, go home and lose weight. But it, it's far more complicated than that. And when you have a look at the weight loss data, it's extremely difficult for a person who is overweight to then lose that weight. And, and that's been borne out within, within the data. Now, there are strategies that, that do improve your chances but overall it is difficult and making sure that you're seeing the person as a whole is just so crucial so you know if 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 there is an element of depression making sure that they're getting the help that they need um, and then it's trying to find a diet that will then work for them so you know there, there's a lot of different cultures of people that, that I see through the clinic. So it's making sure that we come up with a diet that will actually work for them and that you can, it's not just gonna be a yo-yo diet where you can stick with the diet for a week or two and then everything goes out the window. It's, it's about making small changes that are going to be permanent and then you build on those changes. So, and it's the same thing with exercise. So, so that, that's, what we try and, that's what we try and do with those people. Um, and then it's making sure that we regularly follow them up as well. And, then there's a bunch of other screening tools that, that we need to do. So for example, if a 60 year old comes to me um, and you know, if, if they're female and they haven't had their cervical smears, if they haven't had their mammograms, um, you know, if, if we haven't looked at you know, bowel cancer screening, all of those things we need to tick off as well. And, and again, those are the things that, that truly matter that can, if you, know, if you catch disease early, you can treat it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, yeah, like prevention is kind of the best, you know, healthcare in terms of uh, actually making sure that you don't get uh, sick because it's much harder to fix things um, compared to like preventing them. And uh, yeah. kind of the, the earlier you start or the earlier to detect something, uh, then uh, the easier or the more, the more likely it is that you're gonna, you know, um, cure it or uh, live for longer. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But, yeah, but uh, what's what what is um, you know, obviously there's, you know, just living longer chronologically, but what's like the difference between like the health span and the lifespan? How do you, are there anything like specifically that you look at in terms of looking at health span specifically and then looking at the lifespan specifically? Yeah. So humans, they've got a theoretical age limit, if you like it at the moment, it's about 115 to 120 years. That That's roughly the, the, the maximum lifespan that, that we can aim for. Um, but I don't necessarily think that looking at maximum lifespan is, is that interesting. Because, you know, say if you're an 80 year old, and you're in a rest home, and you've got the option of, you know, living in a rest home for another, you know, 30 years. I, personally, I don't really want that. So I think it's far more interesting to look at health span. And what we mean by that is that the healthy years that you have on on planet Earth, and Every, again, everyone's got a different definition of that. But for me, health span is just being able to do the activities that you want to do, being independent with your mobility, being able to go for a, you know, a gentle run. If, if you can maximize that time in your life, that to me is very interesting. And, and there are ways that you can do that. And we've touched on some already, specifically around diet and exercise. There, there are some 
treatments that, that are coming available and, and the research is starting to support them um, that, that may add on to diet and exercise. But yeah, I, I suppose I just can't stress enough that it is diet and exercise that, that truly matter and everything else. It's very interesting to talk about, but the research is still coming through. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> exercise, I think, yeah, it's the kind of most powerful anti-aging drug uh, there is. And uh, there is no like no supplement that does the same things as exercise uh, or as much as exercise does. And uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, pretty clear that, you know, if you don't exercise, then you're not going to have uh, that longer of a health span. If you exercise, then you do lengthen the uh, functional years or the fitness years of your life that you're able to yeah, just be more independent and um more healthier as well for a longer time yeah that's right because you know muscle performance or, or muscle strength um it, it i believe i believe that the latest research is that it starts to decline from about 30 years old mm-hmm. unless you're you're actually you know stimulating that um that muscle building process so you know, again th- there is such a massive difference that that everyone can make to their health even if you're starting late you can still make a, a massive change um, like take smoking, for example, um, you know, if, if, if someone's been a chain smoker for most of their life, if they do stop smoking, you can reverse a lot of that damage that you've done to your lungs. And yes, you'll still have a residual chance of developing lung cancer. But in terms of the actual lung function, you can make a massive difference. And it, it's exactly the same with exercise. It's never too late to start. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but what about diet? Like, um, you know, I, I, I think that you, I, I saw some uh, videos about, you know, intermittent fasting and calorie restriction. So uh, what's, what kind of, uh, let's say, I don't know, principles do you follow in terms of the, uh, the diet? And uh, are there any like, yeah, you know, guidelines you follow uh, per, per, you know, personally? Yeah, let's, let's start with fasting first, and then we can go through different diets. So there was a lot of excitement around intermittent fasting small window in the day and that was borne out from some mice data where if if you calorie matched mice but one group of mice only ate within a small eight hour window in the day compared to another group of mice who could eat whenever they want the group that was you know eating within that small window in the day had significantly longer life they were fitter they had less rates of obesity and um, and diabetes. So the, the hope was that we could translate that to humans, where if humans were eating within a small eight hour window in the day, we would also see all of these exciting benefits. The trouble is a, a mouse and humans are vastly different, specifically with the speed of our metabolism. Mm. So a mice fasting for 16 hours in the day is vastly different to a human fasting for 16 hours in the day. To, to get roughly the, the equivalent time, it would be the equivalent of a human fasting for around four days. So when you have a look at the, the trials in humans, looking at time-restricted feeding, if you match both groups for calories, essentially there's no added benefit for time-restricted feeding, which is an interesting finding. So yes, there's been a lot of hype, but for me personally, I don't practice time-restricted feeding because the data just doesn't support it. What I'm quite interested in is prolonged fasting. So, so multi-day fasts. And the reason for that is it, it seems that if, if, you, if you do fast for longer than say 48 hours, you burn through your reserves in your liver. And, and once you do that, you activate autophagy, which is the process of clearing away old cell components. So essentially it's, it's getting rid of those old cell components so that when you start feeding again, you can rebuild new ones. So, so you know, out with the old you know, damaged mitochondria and, and rebuilding them. So that process to me is very interesting. So you know, roughly every three months, I'll do between a five to seven day water fast. Um, you know, taking a multivitamin at the same time. That mm. type of fasting to me is interesting. Now, we, we don't have robust human data yet on those prolonged fasts to see, you know, how much of a difference it's actually making. But for me, for, from a mechanistic standpoint, it makes sense that if, you, if we are going to see these benefits from fasting, it makes sense to have a multi-day fast. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like, you know, mice are very different and uh to get the equivalent of benefits of fasting from a, from a mouse to humans, then you need to yeah, like fast several days, probably. 
and yeah, the problem is you can't do it like all the time as a human. So um, it's much, or even even then, like the even if it did work, the life that you live would be like a very, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> sad or <laughs> very kind of challenging or very difficult to be constantly starving and uh, cold and that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, th I think there are like you know possible ways of mimicking those effects of calorie restriction or extended fasting and uh, and uh, just you know getting some similar benefits without necessarily going to have to fast for that long. But I do also believe that uh, an extended fast every once in a while will have these uh, longevity benefits, even if it is mostly media, even if it were to be only mediated by calorie restriction, then even then uh, fasting is a way, great way or easy way to kind of achieve a severe calorie restriction. Uh, because, you know, for calorie restriction to work, then you also need to be in quite a, quite a deep calorie restriction as well for a long time. And that is also like challenging in other ways. Um, so uh, that's why I say going through a three-day fast only or five-day fast, it's a more, more, more like a compressed, very intense form of calorie restriction that uh, may actually have some additional unique benefits uh, besides just the calorie restriction as well. There's also some potential downsides of time-restricted feeding. So th there's been interesting data coming through showing that when you, um, if, if you've got a person who hasn't been previously time-restricted feeding and you measure their, um, you, you, you measure their uh, muscle bulk on a DEXA scan, for example, and then you then they start time restricted feeding, and then you redo the DEXA scan to look at their muscle bulk. It seems that their their muscle declines with time restricted feeding, which is an interesting finding. So it 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 might not. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the other crucial things is that with with fasting, we do need to be exercising as well. We need to be trying to hold on to our muscle bulk and our muscle performance. Um, no, no matter what type of fasting that we're doing. Hmm. Yeah, completely agree. Um, fortunately, like, you know, you can for sure, like, prevent the muscle loss with, um, like, just making sure that you eat enough protein and uh, exercise resistance training as well. Um, but um, what do you think about protein then? Like, uh, do you think like a high protein or low protein diet is the best for longevity <laughs> or what? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. Um, there, there's a lot of different opinions out there and that's just simply borne out because there's conflicting research. Uh, it's, there's an enzyme within the, within the body called mTOR and mTOR, when you switch it on, it builds muscle. Uh, trouble is when you switch on mTOR all the time, you're never activating autophagy, which is what we've talked about before. So it, it seems like you need a balance. You need periods of time where you're eating protein and you're switching on mTOR and building muscle, but equally when there's times where you're switching mTOR off, so, so you're not having protein and that's where the fasting comes in um, so that you can clear away those old cell components. So when it comes to what is the optimal um, you know, protein intake for longevity, you, you probably want to balance. You don't want too much, but you don't want too little either because you, you, you want both. You want periods of time again, where you're building muscle but also periods of time where you're clearing away old cell components. So for me, generally with a diet, I'm just trying to strike a middle ground because I, yeah. I, I want, I want both. And I think, I think diets where you go extreme one way or extreme the other way, you're, you're opening yourself up to risks. And, and we yeah. simply don't know that the best diet, because again, there's such conflicting information out there. Mm. Yeah, I think like almost any, like you're going to die eventually. So, uh, and, and, and different diets affect that um, uh, differently. Like, um, let's say a low protein diet may have some effect on increasing longevity, but at the same time, it increases the risk of uh, hip fractures and osteoporosis. So, you can choose to die from a hip fracture, or you can choose to die from uh, uh, some other thing, but uh, it depends on the diet that you follow. So, uh, yeah, it's. Um, I think, yeah, like moderation and uh, just eating like a whole foods diet uh, without uh, excess calories and uh, without maybe like crazy, crazy high spiking of uh, blood sugar and without crazy high fat and without crazy high protein. So kind of a middle ground, generally like a good, um, yeah, just a good golden rule of balance. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I think a, a lot of the so-called longevity community is coming around to that fact that, you know, it's it's a balanced diet that's probably the, the best way to go. Mm. Um and, you know, taking your examples about protein, you're, you're absolutely right that a low protein diet has been associated with longer lifespan, but 
you know, you're, you're probably going to be weaker or, or, you know, not be able to do the things that you want to do on a low protein diet, because again, you just don't have the muscle strength to get around and you do increase your chances of hip fractures and whatnot on a low protein diet. So mm. coming, coming back to that point of around 60 years old, that's where the body seems to flip. So mm. it, 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 for a lot of my patients that I'm seeing in the clinic now, if they're over 60 years old, I'm really trying to encourage them to eat more protein again, to try and hold on to the muscle bulk that mm. they've, that they've got. Mm. So that yeah. I think that that would be quite a crucial thing is that, you know, a person who is 20 or 30 is going to have different protein requirements compared to someone who is 60 or 70. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so true. Like there's your studies finding that uh, after 60, the higher protein intake is associated with a uh, longer longevity and uh, before 60, it's kind of the opposite so that the because you know even then you don't need that much protein when you're younger your body is, has already more muscle and it holds on to it better and you build muscle more easily you stimulate protein synthesis more easily whereas in the after 60 you don't do that so then you would need to compensate for that with a higher protein intake uh, which is uh, quite uh, interesting and <laughs> funny yeah um but maybe let's uh, switch gears to uh, supplements so you also have a lot of uh, videos about supplements these different kinds of longevity uh, potential drugs and uh, compounds so but before we get into like the kind of a more popular ones maybe what are some of the maybe like yeah like a starter pack as well for like a longevity supplement list or some of the ones that you think are the best cheapest ones and uh, kind of easiest ones people uh, could use yeah so before i get into that I, I do just want to emphasize and i keep going on about this no supplement is going to replace diet and exercise mm. so th these supplements are trying to add on to um to that so when it comes to supplements, if, if you wanted to dip your toe in, if you like, I, I don't really see any downside for taking omega-3. I think that, you know, that, that's been around for a long time. There's a lot of safety data on it. There's a suggestion um, that uh, in 2020, there was a meta-analysis by the Mayo Clinic, um, which, you know, when they combine all of the data together, it seems that by taking omega-3, you do improve heart health. And by that, I mean, you likely reduce your chance of having a heart attack. So I, I think if, if anyone wanted to dip their toe into supplements, omega-3 would probably be the way to go. And mm. the second one would be vitamin D. So a lot of people now are working indoors. We're not seeing enough sunlight and therefore our vitamin D levels are low. And I think it was in 2019 in the British Medical Journal, they supplemented vitamin D and they could see a clear and statistically significant reduction in coughs and colds for people that were taking vitamin D. So it's not just bones that we're helping with vitamin D. It also seems to be our immune system that we're helping with vitamin D. So I think if, if anyone wanted to, again, dip their toe in, omega-3 and vitamin D would be a good place to start. Hmm. Um, and then after that, we've talked a lot about trying to, you know, look after yourself with muscle performance and, and muscle bulk. One of the most underrated supplements, in my opinion, is creatine. So mm. creatine, there's a truckload of human data. We've been using it for a long period of time. It is a safe supplement and it, it does improve muscle performance. Um, and so in, in terms of your workout, and it also helps with muscle recovery. So initially there were concerns around, you know, kidney performance and, and would taking creatine adversely affect your kidney function but there's no long-term data suggesting that um which is great so that would be probably the third supplement that that i would start is creatine mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah creatine also has like other besides the muscle performance side it also has like cognitive effects and uh, helps with bone density methylation and uh improves intelligence and iq so <laughs> and i think yeah it's a very uh, underrated for sure supplement and uh, just yeah. needed for overall energy uh, production so you need energy yeah. for everything and it's kind of good mm -hmm. uh but what about uh, one question about the omega-3s um uh, I, obviously like i would imagine that the quality of the omega-3s also matters because you know there's a lot of a lot of omega-3s on the market tend to be like oxidized and uh, rancid uh, so i think you know, those the, because once the fat, uh, the PUFAs in the uh, fat or the fish uh, get oxidized, then they actually become quite damaging to the body and harmful, causing a lot of like this uh, lipid peroxidation and oxidative stress. So, uh, you know, what are, what are real, maybe like sources of uh, omega 3s that you uh, use or find? Yeah, you've touched on something vital is that, you know, 
the supplement industry is not regulated like what medications are. So it, it's very important to try and do everything that we can to make sure that there's no added things within the supplements that we're taking and making sure that the supplements are actually what we want. So there's a, there's a great resource called labdoor.com. And what they do is third-party test a lot of supplements that we take. And on Labdoor, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different brands that are tested for omega-3 and creatine and, and virtually whatever other supplement that you want to take. So I, before taking any supplement, I always check them against Labdoor to see, you know, which one is the so-called best, which one's the purest, um, mm. and, and, and go from there. So for, for me, that's, that's the, the best way of making sure that the supplements that we are taking are safe. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That's a good uh, resource to know. Um, but what about some of yeah, like more, I'd say more um, intriguing or uh, more like you know popular longevity supplements uh, that are recently that you find, or uh, what are what are what are like your most favorite ones uh, in terms of uh, that actually may have like an um, additional longevity effect? Yeah. So there, there's a lot of different supplements out there, and it's quite tricky to navigate which ones are hype and which ones may actually pan out. So for me, what I, what I try and focus in on is what the interventions testing program are coming up with. So the interventions testing program is a group in the United States. And what's special about them is that they run out of three separate labs. And so th they'll take a bunch of supplements and they'll, they'll test them in these three separate labs uh, with mice that are what we call genetically heterogeneous. So, so that just means that they're not just one gene pool, that there are a variety of genes. Um, so it tries to match the real world. And they'll placebo control um, these supplements and they'll see which ones will actually extend lifespan. Um, and th there's, been, there's, there's only been a few molecules that seem to extend lifespan. Um, but what's great about this program is that it also that they publish all of their results. So a lot of molecules that they've tested um, don't have positive results. So they'll publish those and we can say, you know, that one was hype. Let's move on to the ones that actually seem to be extending lifespan. So I suppose that the shining example of that is a molecule called rapamycin. So rapamycin, I think it was discovered in the 1960s. And currently within medicine, it's used as an immunosuppressant to stop organ rejection. So if people need a kidney transplant, they will take rapamycin to stop their body rejecting that organ. So it sounds like quite a radical idea that that's a molecule that can um, extend lifespan. But how that molecule works is that it acts on mTOR, which we've already talked about. So it seems that as we age, mTOR is switched on more and more. It's almost like the body is trying to compensate for our muscle decline. It wants to try and rebuild that muscle. The trouble with doing that is, again, you're never activating autophagy. So that's where rapamycin comes in. If you, It seems that if, if we're using rapamycin intermittently to switch on mTOR, but then, uh, sorry, to switch off mTOR, um, but then also have periods where we're switching on mTOR, that seems to be providing a lifespan benefit. Now that's borne out in mice. It will be very interesting to see if that's borne out in humans. So, you know, th that's personally why I'm why I've set up a clinical trial to look at rapamycin in humans. So, so that's one example. Um, there's a couple of other examples that um, of molecules that we can actually grab onto. One of them is glycine, which is a non so-called non-essential amino acid. Glycine is one of the fundamental building blocks of an antioxidant in the body called glutathione. So glutathione levels, in the blood at least, decline with age, particularly around the age of 45 to 50. So it seems that you know, when, when mice in the interventions testing program, when they had quite large dosages of glycine, there was a lifespan extension benefit. So again, it would be interesting to see if that bears out in humans. Mm. There, is, there is some potential evidence that it will though. So. <clears throat> There was a trial of COVID patients um, and half of them were given placebo. The other half were given a combination of supplements called combined metabolic activators. And one of them, well, some of those supplements um, were to do with rebuilding glutathione. And when those, when the combined metabolic activator, um, what well, the combined metabolic activator group actually recovered from COVID a whopping three days faster compared to placebo. So you know, there, there is 
some human data coming through around you know glycine and glutathione coming through mm, um nice. yeah yeah I, I i do i'm a huge fan of glycine as well and uh yeah, yeah so one of my favorite uh, like longevity supplements uh, that i take on a daily basis and uh, yeah besides uh, the, the things that you mentioned uh, glutathione it also has uh, this balancing effect on uh, methionine which uh in excess has been linked to aging and uh, cancer even so the glycine like just counteracts methionine and the glycine supplementation has been found to be uh, associated with uh, basically um, having the same effect as methionine restriction on longevity without necessarily restricting methionine. So I think everyone who eat, eats like a, any kind of protein in uh, larger amounts, they will definitely need to take uh, the glycine to uh, counteract uh, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and th th there's also been a few other examples of, of methods that we were hopeful would extend lifespan, but haven't. So one of them is, um, one of them is resveratrol. So resveratrol was tested by the interventions testing program at quite large dosages, and it didn't extend lifespan. Another one is um, aspirin. So in the initial trials with the interventions testing program at quite a low dose, aspirin was associated with a slightly longer lifespan, but at higher dosages of aspirin, there was no effect. Um, it's actually the same with omega-3. So mm. omega-3 was trialed and it didn't extend lifespan. I personally still take omega-3 because I want to try and reduce my heart attack risk. Um, mm. There's also some evidence around cognition as well. Um, so yeah, the, and then the, there's a few other supplements that, that I personally take that, haven't, that, that have been tested by the intervention testing program. So one of them is nicotinamide riboside. So <clears throat> we've touched a lot about um, metabolism uh, you know, with this podcast and how it seems to decline from about the age of 60. One of the central molecules to metabolism is NAD, which we can see declines as we age. And by taking precursors such as nicotinamide riboside, we can probably rebuild our NAD and make our metabolism more resilient against disease. So again, if that, that's part of the combined metabolic activator group of supplements that was treating COVID patients with that three-day faster recovery. So mm -hmm. nicotinamide riboside, when it was tested again by the interventions testing program, it didn't extend lifespan, but I'm, I'm more excited about what it will do for diseased states. Again, if, if we catch COVID or there's fatty liver or, mm -hmm. you know, so, something like that, nicotinamide riboside probably would help. Um, mm. again we're still waiting on more human data to come mm. through yeah i think yeah. i think it might be because of you know because of the role nad ha has on the body like um you know uh, with high nad your body just has like more energy essentially to uh, do repair and uh, conduct antioxidant defenses and uh, start to kind of clean out the, the uh, like be more resilient essentially but if you have a disease state like diabetes or uh, high inflammation and you uh, some other like say that you're not sleeping enough and those kind of things uh, then your nad levels will be by, by default lower because the body has to use that nad to kind of counteract the disease state and if you and then once your nad gets depleted then it's like a downward spiral that you start to become more vulnerable to those disease states and uh, that dep depletes nad further etc etc so yeah like maybe those nad supplements and nad boosters tend to be the best used when your body is under recovered uh, or under some sort of um, higher amounts of stress and higher amounts of disease state uh, to kind of bump up the NAD levels so that NAD that could be like, you know, scooped off the top for the dealing with that disease state and uh, healing that and then being able to get back on track of the actual recovery process. NAD is again, <clears throat> the resilience to disease. Um, it's not so much lifespan extension that, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the mice data essentially doesn't support it. And if you have a look at, um, so there's a molecule called niacin, which used to be used a lot in medicine to lower cholesterol levels and, mm. and has been used for decades. So there's a lot of data on so-called NAD boosting, and it doesn't, it seems that it doesn't extend lifespan in humans. So the mice data doesn't support it. The human data doesn't support it. But what seems to be apparent is those diseased states by taking you know, molecules that boost NAD, we are more resilient and then can likely recover faster from those diseased states. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Nice. W which one of the NAD boosters do you think is the kind of most um, optimistic or has the highest potential, NMN, and NR, or uh, nicotinamide, or niacin? Yeah, it's, there's a lot of debate within the preclinical world 
as to which molecule is so-called best. Um, I think any supplement that we take, we need to make sure, first of all, that it's safe. So there's a lot of human safety data on nicotinamide riboside. Um, and th there's, there's a good mechanism for how nicotinamide riboside can improve health. So personally, that, that's the one that, that I've chosen. Um, there, there, there's a lot of debate about, you know, how is NMN or NR actually absorbed into the body? Is it all converted into nicotinamide first before, you know, it actually reaches our cells? You get different replies from who, you know, different people within the preclinical world. So for me, I'm just going with the one that's got the most human data, which is nicotinamide riboside. So I personally plan on, on taking that either when I'm under significant stress. So, you know, for example, when my second child comes about and there's going to be significant sleep deprivation, I'll probably start it then. Um, otherwise, it started around the age of 35. Currently, I'm taking a small dose of niacin, so 100 milligrams a day. Um, I, I do that again because we've got so much human data on it. It, it is a safe molecule with those small dosages. Um, and that is probably giving me all the NAD support that I need right now as a 30 year old. Mm, yeah, for sure. I, I agree. I do um, take uh, like NMN on days that I'm like sleep deprived or something like that. Uh, and I take like a nicotinamide, uh, the regular nicotinamide uh, on a daily basis. So again, for the other benefits besides the NAD boosting, like the other health benefits that it has. Uh, and uh, yeah, then the NAD boost, a little bit we get, get from that is just like the side, side effect of that, like a good side effect. Um, uh, but I wanted to ask, like, uh, just like a th thought that I got when you were, to we were talking about like the, because of the role of NAD in metabolism and the higher energy that you have, et cetera. Uh, is there like any, or yeah, like is there any longevity data about it using ATP as a supplement? <laughs> because, you know, ATP, it's directly the end product of energy uh, or, you know, the, the molecule of energy. Uh, and uh, with higher energy, your body will be just, you know, being able to uh, have higher antioxidant defense and to just do more things. So is, I haven't, I haven't looked into it myself, but just the thought that I got, like, is there any like longevity data on ATP as a supplement? To be honest, I wouldn't have thought so because the this body burns through ATP in vast quantities every day. Um, so you'd have to be taking a, a huge amount of, of ATP, I would have thought to, to make a difference. And to be honest, I mean, if, it, if you're requiring ATP as a supplement, um, I'd, I'd be very skeptical about what's happening within the cell itself. If you know, if if your cells right. can't produce enough ATP, you will die very, very, very quickly. So, I, I I wouldn't have thought that supplementing ATP would be would be beneficial because, um, yeah, you'd have to be taking vast amounts of it, and mm. yeah, it, it, mm. yeah. So I, I I wouldn't have thought so. Mm. Yeah, well, maybe like well, <laughs> would be interesting to know. Maybe maybe they do a few studies in the future. Um, but just a thought. Um, another cool thing that I've been recently uh, interested. But let, maybe let's stick to the NAD side uh, and uh, for a moment, uh, because it relates to the sirtuins. Uh, so uh, sirtuins consume NAD to do their work, and they are like usually considered these longevity uh, molecules. And uh, sirt two and six, sirt six tends to be uh, the most associated or most promising one, uh, most linked to uh, longevity and lifespan. And uh, sirt six is also like a, a supplement that, that can be uh, used. So, what are your thoughts on like uh, sirtuins? Yeah, it's it's very tricky to answer because there again, there's so much conflicting data. When the hype around sirtuins first came out, um, you know, there, there was there was a company that was sold for, I think it was $120 million to GSK uh, around the hype of, you know, so-called activating sirtuins. And, mm. and, they, and sirtuins were sold as longevity genes. Uh, subsequent labs have, have tested sirtuins. Um, so, and, and there's actually some data suggesting that if you delete sirtuins, you will, ex um, and, and yeast, it extends their lifespan. So um, I'm not at all convinced, and, and I don't think the research supports that sirtuins are longevity genes. Um, you know, speaking with, with people who were directly involved with 
you know, discovering Satuans, um, you know, people like Dr. Matt Caberline, um, you know, Professor Brian Kennedy, um, you know, Dr. Charles Brenner, none of them would, would I think, say that Satuans are longevity genes. And, and, and they were directly involved, um, you know, with outlining how Satuans work. So I'm, and, and you know, the, the mice data doesn't support it either. Um, and the human data doesn't support it either. So I, I, I personally, I'm, I'm not excited about Satuans. I think they're prop, they, I, you know, I think we need Satuans, but I don't mm-hmm. think that trying to overactivate them will, will give benefits to, to humans. Right, right. Um, yeah, the, the data just doesn't support it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's uh, again like a minimal, you need a certain threshold. And uh, after that, you don't need to activate them further. Yeah, again, I, I, there's a reason why we've got Satuans, um, but there's, there's no convincing data. And, and actually, I think there's more convincing data to say that they're not associated with lifespan um, mm. in terms of extending lifespan. Gotcha. Um, so mm. w- when it comes to Satuan 6, so overall, there are seven different Satuans within humans. And the initial excitement was around Satuan 1. Um, but you know, I, I think rightly so that the research hasn't really supported that trying to activate Satu and one gives meaningful benefits to humans. So the attention seems to have changed to Satu and six. And there was some mice data that came out showing that if you genetically alter mice to overexpress Satu and six, that was associated with a longer lifespan, um, which is interesting. But again, you're it, it's one it's in mice and two you're genetically altering these mice to, to um to overexpress the two and six so it wasn't supplements that that was doing this so personally I, I i don't think that you know running away with the hype is is going to be useful for people i think it, it should certainly be researched it's interesting but i don't take a two and six activator um yeah. i think we first need the mice data then we need the human data to come through to make sure that those molecules that activate the two and six are safe and do activate the two and six in humans. And then we need, you know, larger trials to actually see, is there a meaningful benefit? Um, I, I don't think at, at this point, taking the two and six activators is, is a good use of money. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I don't take the activators either, but uh, I do do things that promote so two and activation, like, you know, exercise and fasting and, uh, color restriction and uh, also like the circadian rhythm side, which I think is quite underrated from the side, but because like the circadian rhythm alignment <clears throat> activates cert one or keeps it uh, activated, and uh, that cert one also uh, ties into together to the uh, recycling of NAD plus through the NAMPT uh, pathway. So uh, I think just being aligned with the circadian rhythm allows your basically circadian rhythm system to uh, help you to recycle NAD. Uh, on a regular basis and if you have that working properly then the requirement to supplement the nad or so two wins will also go down because your body is recycling the nad itself and that any mpt pathway is just you know circadian rhythm dependent you need to circadian rhythm alignment to have that uh, working properly and to recycle the nad yeah i think that there's a lot of things to unpack there so with nad it is central to our metabolism and it is involved with a whole bunch of of different enzymes. Um, Sirtuins are are a a very small part of of what NAD actually helps to fuel. Um, So, you know, I I don't think that the the benefits to human health are to do with, you know, activating Sirtuins. Because again, NAD, it it fuels so many different things. And, you know, circadian rhythm, Absolutely. You know, there's very good data showing that if you disrupt that circadian rhythm, um, that's, you know, associated with obesity, with, you know, diabetes, with heart disease. Um, It's one of the reasons why I wanted to start working in a clinic. So I didn't have to do shift work anymore. Mm, Um, But those, um, the the benefits of staying within that regular circadian rhythm, you know, I, I don't think it's got a huge amount to do with Sirtuins, you know, the circadian rhythm will affect so many different pathways within the body. Um, so, so to to say that most of those benefits are to do because of sirtuins, I, I don't think that's that's correct. Because um, mm, yeah. again, it, it 
you know, the circadian rhythm will affect so many different pathways. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I was just saying that the circadian rhythm um, end is, is uh, basically, you end up with this uh, higher NAD salvage through the circadian rhythm system, essentially. And, yes, uh, yeah, so, yeah. So, no, and so, I and see so, what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, and sirtuins so, so are in the middle of that. <laughs> so you don't need necessarily, they're not like, you know, the ones, the key component, but they are like, you know, in the middle of that, that pathway. Yeah, I think that they are a component, yeah. but but e yeah. equally that there's so many other things within that level um, that that get influenced by yeah. higher NAD and and a better recycling system of mm. that NAD. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about uh, alpha ketoglutarate? That's also like actually actually has had some human data showing that it it's, it show it slows down like or uh, decreases the biological age or the DNA methylation age, uh, but it's uh, yeah. Is it, do you think consider that to be um, some good evidence that it may have some potential for longevity? Yeah, so I think it was last year that the um, paper in mice came out showing, I believe it was about an 18% improvement in, in mice lifespan when they were supplemented with alpha ketoglutarate. And again, it's, it's a very interesting molecule. And the study that, that you're referring to um, recently came out where they took, I can't remember how many people it was, but they, they measured their DNA methylation age, um, they, they supplemented with alpha ketoglutarate, and then they re-measured their DNA methylation age. And mm. there was, I believe, an overall eight-year reduction yeah. in their DNA methylation age. So that makes for fantastic headlines. But as, as we went through near the beginning of the, of the podcast, looking at solely DNA methylation age, there's many different ways of measuring that. Um, mm. So it's it's quite and and so it's quite difficult to interpret first of all the data. That study that that we're talking about now wasn't placebo controlled. So you know these these groups of people could have massively changed their diet. They could have started exercising more. They could have been sleeping better, and all of those things could have been contributing to this this better measurement of DNA methylation age. Yeah. Um, so alpha ketoglutarate it's, it's an interesting molecule. Um, I, I certainly think that it needs to have more human data. Mm. Um, I, I think it's just important that the human data is, you know, comes out from placebo controlled randomized trials um, with appropriate outcomes to see will there actually be an improvement in human health or not. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I personally don't take alpha ketoglutarate yet. Um, I'm still waiting on more data to come through to see if there is a true benefit for humans. Mm, yeah i i started taking it recently uh just to yeah try it out and um i think uh, yeah I, I agree that it should have like a lot more uh, research and uh, like it would be good to see like how it affects things like you know the biomarkers how it affects cholesterol and triglycerides and uh blood sugar and those kind of things to see like more yeah actual um you know more specific uh data points uh, but yeah the, the thing with the alpha ketoglutarate is that uh it also dec declines with age, the same with NAD and uh, and uh, like you know muscle, etc. But the, you can't really get it from a dietary source. There's no like food that contains the alpha ketoglutarate. Like it's just molecule in the metabolism, and yeah, the only way to get it from, would be with a dietary like a supplement. But we don't know like whether or not you know whether or not it would raise your body's endogenous alpha ketoglutarate stores. And whether or not it would have like any effect, but um, yeah, like theoretically, it would, be, it would be something that you know does de decline with age, and uh, the only way to get it would be like through a supplement. But yeah, maybe it's the same with ATP. Like maybe you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tricky. There, there are many things that decline with age, mm. and it's it's trying to figure out you know would correcting that decline actually result in improved health. Mm. It it may do. I'm 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 not I'm not saying that this molecule isn't exciting. I think it is exciting, um, but but I think that that excitement needs to be generated. Uh, sorry, it needs to be directed to well conducted human trials because uh, you know yeah. otherwise the supplements that that people would be taking, you know, the, the list would just be massive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and I, you know I I just get concerned. Yeah, if, if people are taking a lot of different supplements, what is that going? What is that combination going to be doing to them? And mm. we've also touched on, you know, how pure are these supplements? Because the supplement industry is not regulated, so th there is the potential of doing a lot of harm by taking a, a lot of different supplements. So, mm. yeah, you know, that that's the that's the other thing to consider. For sure. Uh, speaking of <laughs> the long list of supplements, so like, uh, what kind of supplements are you taking? Or um, yeah. And maybe like explain some of the reasons uh, why. 
Yeah. Um, so I take a first thing when I when I wake up um, on days that I haven't exercised, I take a molecule um, to produce sulforaphane. So sulforaphane is a molecule <clears throat> that activates an enzyme called NRF2. So it's essentially that, that's like a master redox switch within the body. So if you switch that on, you activate a whole host of defense pathways against oxidants. Now, when, when activating NRF2 was tested by the interventions testing program, there was a lifespan extension benefit. It was small, but it was there. So I, I personally um, take that in the morning. But th there's also data showing that if you take molecules to activate your antioxidant defenses, that probably gets in the way of exercise benefits. So when you exercise, you're, you're, you are damaging your cells and you're releasing a lot of different oxidants. But it actually seems that when, when you do have that burst of oxidants, it stimulates your cells to become more efficient, to deal with those oxidants better. So if you, <clears throat> if you remove those oxidants too quickly, you likely interfere with those with the stress response. So that's why I only take this molecule um, on days that I don't exercise. Um, I have, you know, moving on to other supplements, <clears throat> I take collagen. So when I first looked into collagen, I thought it was just complete hype. Um, but when you when you have a look at the human data, there, there is improvements that we can see. There's improvements in skin health. Um, and there's probably improvements in blood vessel health as well. So I take hydrolyzed collagen, about 10 grams. Um, and, and with that, I also take hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid is also a supplement that I thought was complete baloney when I first looked into it, because I, I wasn't convinced that the body could actually absorb it because it's a very long molecule. But again, the, the human data is quite convincing that, you know, hyaluronic acid do supplements when they're placebo controlled it does improve skin health so if it improves skin health what other markers of health is it improving so you know i i, I also take that um we've also talked about how i take niacin um with niacin there is um issues with um with boosting a, a molecule within the body called homocysteine mm. so to to reduce that i take another supplement called tmg or trimethylglycine mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I also take omega-3, um, vitamin D. Sorry, <laughs> take a bit of a list. Um, mm -hmm. no, no, go ahead. Creat creatine as well. Um, one of the other supplements that, that I'm considering stopping is metformin. So I, I do take metformin on days that I don't exercise. Um, I'm not, I'm not actually that, I, I'm not that excited about the data on metformin as as what I once used to be. So again, the interventions testing program trialed metformin. It didn't extend lifespan, hmm. um, which I think is is quite significant because a, a lot of the hype around metformin was in the mice data. Hmm. Um, so, so some of the studies were showing a lifespan extension benefit, whereas when the interventions testing program trialed it, which is the creme de la creme of mice data, there mm. was no there was no benefit. So okay. I'm less excited about that. What I am excited about in terms of diabetic medications, though, so which is what metformin is, there's a class of diabetic medications called SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, essentially, what it does, it, it works on the kidneys to make you pee out sugar. And mm. when the intervention testing program trialed that, I believe it was a 14% improvement in lifespan. Wow. And how it seems to work is that it, it blunts the peaks in blood sugar levels. So instead of your blood sugar level spiking after a meal, it, it flattens that curve. Um, and, it, and that's the most likely reason as to why these SGLT2 inhibitors improve lifespan. So I'm, I'm considering stopping metformin um, and I'm just waiting on a bit more human data to come through about the SGLT2 inhibitors because that's a medication that I prescribe in my clinical practice to my type two diabetic patients. And we're getting fantastic results in terms of, you know, weight loss, uh, decreased heart disease, decreased kidney disease. And you can see it with the markers that, that we're actually testing for. Um, nice. Yeah. Mm, that's cool. Is that all, all the supplements? Um, th there's, a, <laughs> there's a few more. Okay. Well, um, I do. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I do take um, vitamin K2. Mm. Um, there, there's, there's a suggestion in the data that, um, so, so vitamin K2 works on a group of proteins called GLA proteins, which seem to control where the calcium goes in the body. So either it, it's going to get deposited in, in other tissues in the body, such as your blood vessels, or is it going to stay within your bones, which is where you want it? The, the human data looking at um, vitamin K2, it's not that exciting for reducing heart disease, but it is exciting for um, reducing fracture or, or bone breaks as we age. So that's primarily the, the reason why I take it is to make sure that I, I am activating my GLA protein so that my calcium stays within my bones as opposed to spreading elsewhere where I don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do take a, a very small dose of melatonin at night. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, there's, I, I take only 300 micrograms. So, so people with, um, who take melatonin, they're often mega, mega dosing melatonin. And, right. and I, I don't really understand why people do that because the, the dosages that they take are, are far in excess from what the body will produce by itself. So I take a small dose of 300 micrograms and that's primarily to make sure that I'm falling asleep when I want to fall asleep. Melatonin levels, they decline as we age. So um, that's one of the reasons why older people, they do struggle to fall asleep and stay asleep is simply they don't have enough melatonin. So, um, you know, taking melatonin in your older years, particularly a prolonged release version of melatonin seems to make sense. Um, particularly if you take it, you know, three or four hours before you want to fall asleep. But as of right now, again, since I'm 30, I'm not worried about my levels of melatonin. I just want to make sure that I fall asleep when I want to fall asleep. Um, yeah. There, we, we haven't really talked about senolytics yet. Mm. So senolytics are, well, it, it's a therapy where we're hopeful that we can remove old cells. Um, yeah. so, so senescent cells are, some people refer to them as zombie cells. So these are cells that have stopped dividing. They're still alive and they're still releasing a lot of different factors within the body. And a lot of those factors are actually quite damaging. So the hope is that if we can clear away those senescent cells um, to, to make way for new cells, essentially it's out with the old and then in with the new. Mm. Um, it, it's exciting. And I, I take a molecule called fisetin um, which is being trialed by the Mayo Clinic at the moment to see whether it will have human benefits. Um, so for five days within the month, I will take fisetin. I'll also take that with um, quercetin as well, which is another molecule that we're hopeful will clear away those senescent cells. Nice. Yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's, so also, that's, that's a bit of a list. But no, yeah. yeah, I almost take almost all of them uh, besides like the metformin and uh some of the other things that you mentioned but yeah i do take a lot of them as and i think they they're like relatively easy like creatine and vitamin k2 and magnesium maybe you do take magnesium yeah i do take magnesium yeah yeah nice yeah like in niacin and those kind of things they're pretty uh good but what about like generally any antioxidants like you know vitamin c or um, ala or anything like that yeah i recently did a video about ala and for, for people with diseases, so, so we've talked a bit about, you know, diseased states and, and how that's different to a healthy person. Mm. So in type 2 diabetics who have got nerve damage, taking ALA seems to alleviate some of their symptoms with, with, that, with the pain that they get from that nerve damage, which is exciting. Trying to translate that, though, to, hum to, to otherwise healthy people um, is very challenging because there is my data showing that if you give ALA it will shorten their lifespan. So what, what we're probably seeing is that if, if there's an imbalance of oxidants to antioxidants, um, if you try and restore that balance with things like ALA, that's probably beneficial. But for otherwise healthy people that, are, that have already got that balance, if you take things like ALA, you might be upsetting that balance where you've got where you're tipping the balance too much towards antioxidants and you don't have enough oxidants, which sounds a bit baffling, but you know, we've already gone through how um, exercise releases a lot of oxidants and, and that initial oxidant stress is actually quite good for cells. So we, we, you know, you don't want too much or too little of really anything in the body. And that, that includes oxidants to antioxidants. So I, I personally 
don't take ALA. Um, again, because I don't want to upset that balance. And then when it comes to vitamin C, again, it seems that you know once you once you're hitting enough vitamin C every day, which you can get from your diet, there doesn't seem to be any benefit of mega dosing you know, vitamin C. There's been a lot of hype and a lot of studies looking into this. Um, yeah. But you know, the, the data simply doesn't support taking vitamin C supplements so long as your diet is already good. You know, yeah. and, and people who are suffering with cancer and are malnourished, then sure, taking a, a multivitamin absolutely absolutely makes sense and that multivitamin would include vitamin c but for otherwise healthy people who have who had great diet regular exercise I, I i can't see the benefit of using your money to, to buy vitamin c supplements right right yeah yeah so the poison the poison is in dose and you need some stress or some some of this oxidation as well to uh, stay healthy and uh, kind of completely nullifying it isn't always uh, the best thing to do yeah that's right Right. Uh, well, it's been really awesome talking with you and uh, we'll start wrapping it up. Um, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? To be honest, it's probably just checking out my YouTube channel. Um, so I, I've got my supplement list uh, there under every video. Um, so that, that would be the, the best place. Um, I'm still practicing you know, medicine here in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so that, that's also another way where you can meet me in person if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, I think what, one of the things that we've again emphasized within this podcast is th there is no substitute for diet and exercise and, and high quality sleep. These supplements are interesting. Um, th there's human data coming through that's starting to support, you know, taking these molecules, um, mm. but you cannot beat diet and exercise. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And my last question, what we'll put all the links in the show notes as well. And uh, my last question is, uh, What's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you had up the sooner? I, I would say um, when I first started my YouTube channel, I was swept away with a lot of the hype that was within the so-called longevity space that, right. you know, we were about to find ways to cure aging or, or reverse aging. Um, I would say it's very easy to get swept up in that hype, but the advice that, that I would give is, you know, be skeptical, be very skeptical. Um, and again, you can't beat diet and exercise. You, yeah. you, you really can't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Awesome, awesome advice and I agree. Uh, well, it was great talking with you and yeah, maybe in the future when there's new studies coming out, we can do like a follow-up. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was good.